Well, you, you see on the screen the, uh, the topic, and uh, I wanted to just kind of launch into this tonight by, by mentioning this, that while I was uh, laid up, and for those who don't know, I, I had uh, knee replacement surgery, and uh, in the words of my doctor, he said it was horrible. And, and I said, yeah, you're right, it was horrible. In fact, last week, the uh, fire chief in Laverne uh, had knee replacement, and he died. And so I don't want to scare anybody. That's not to scare you, but it was, it was not, you know, like somebody told me going in, and they meant well. I love this person. They said, oh, it's a piece of cake. It wasn't for me. <laughs> but there were a lot of changes in my body and stuff, and I just want to mention one little thing. During the whole thing, I had to be very careful with my wife, discerning, watchful, what was coming my way and what I was doing, and was I heeding what the doctor said, what the physical therapist said, and take this Comodin every day, and then the hospital twice a week, you got to get those blood tests, and then physical therapy twice a week, and go through that, and, and, and don't forget your um, uh, the opioid, I mean, uh, you know, and Flomax, and hey, you have to make sure the, the, the softener, and I, I could go on and on, but I mean, really, it was, it was, it was wild. My wife, I, I just, she was wonderful, wonderful. But you know what? I was noticing I had some fungi. I thought, what's this on my toes even? I couldn't figure out this. So I, I asked, my, my wife has a Vietnamese lady that does pedicures and stuff. And I asked her, what do you do? And she said, oh, just get this, fungi nail. I said, does it work? Oh, yeah, fungi nail. And so went to the store and there's pictures here of the, there's the big toe and, you know, the other toe. And it says, you know, toe and foot brand. And I got it and I went home and, you know, stops it around, or nails. And then when I got home, I looked at the bottom. It says, not for nail or scalp fungus. <laughs> what? I checked with the pharmacist. She said, yeah, that's right. I mean, you'd think from what you just see, you'd think, yeah, it's obvious, isn't it? No. That's crazy, isn't it? And I cite this because you know what? There's a lot of stuff floating by us today that deceives propaganda. And if we're not discerning and careful we get misled, deceived, and I'm telling you, that's the launch pad for tonight as we talk about this subject, and the title very simply, as you can see it, is, you know, on our War of the, War, War of the Worldview series, a biblical worldview on immigration. And I wanted to give you, just at the outset, a clear definition from United States documents, because what you're going to hear tonight, and those of you listening video, it's not a matter of, boy, you know, the system's so broken and we need this and we got to get this. There's so much there. We're just not enforcing it. We're disregarding it. We're, we're paying no attention to what has been established to give us good order and peace and security as a nation. So I'm saying this. My dad, those of you listening, was an immigrant, came from Poland. And I believe everything Jesus said in terms of love your neighbor and we're to be generous and hospitable and compassionate. But there's a lot of deception on a major subject, and that subject of immigration, this is the definition from U.S. documents on illegal immigrants. An illegal Im immigrant is an unlawful entrant who came without permission and stays in open defiance to our laws. Not complicated. A lot of this is not complicated, but I can tell you this. I felt God showed me this this week, and, and I'm going to cite a lot of scripture tonight, so stay with me on this. But you know what? People say, well, why can't, our, why can't we just get this stuff done? Why does it keep lingering? I don't understand it. And, you know, public, Republicans say, yeah, we got all three houses. We got the executive branch. We got the Congress. We got the Senate. We can't seem to even pass the simplest laws. Why the stalemate? Why such dysfunction? And you know what? I, I looked at this this week, and, and I thought it was interesting. This this is our, our, our starting point tonight. It says in, don't turn, John chapter 11, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And boy, did that stir up some things. And it said many of the Jews saw that, and they started to believe in Jesus. And many went to the Pharisees. And in verse 47, it says that the chief priests and the Pharisees, they gathered the council. And they said, what are we going to do? And they said this, if we let him go on, on this, if we let him go on this, everyone will believe in him and the Romans will come and they'll take our place. You know why politicians don't want to deal with this? Because they, and I say this, I'm not saying it in a blanket way, instead of caring about America, 
and our future and where we're at, I don't want to lose my place. I don't want to lose my position. And folks, if you study the founding fathers and much of what they said in terms of like term limits and just for a brief time and rotate so people don't lose touch with the people. We've got people in office today, 20, 30, you can see 40 years. They're called career politicians. And they want to find out what... We, we've got to say, look, we pray for our government, but we are going to stand for what Scripture teaches about caring for immigrants. So, Romans 14, 17 this is Paul's masterpiece epistle, and it says here that the, the kingdom or the rule of God is not meat nor drink. In other words, this God's rule, his reign in our lives is not about ceremonial observances, etc., but it is righteousness, peace, and joy, and it's in the Holy Spirit. In other words, being rightly related to God and then pursuing righteousness, which results in peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Now, if you don't follow that and you don't honor the rule and reign of God, what you experience is the opposite. Unrighteousness, confusion, or chaos, and sorrow. And if any of you back up and say, what's going on today? That's exactly what we see in this nation today. And it doesn't surprise me. People say, well, man, it's just such lawlessness. Matthew, I think it's 24, 11. Jesus said, don't be led astray. And then he said, in the last days, he said, because lawlessness is going to abound, the love of many will grow cold. The love of many. And Derek Prince, Bible teacher, once said, lawlessness leads to lovelessness. Lawlessness in a culture and the hostility and the fighting and the incivility. And folks, it's, 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 it's a reality and we're, and we're living in it. Now, Cicero, who was a, an attorney and a, he lived, what? 50, 100 years before Jesus, he made this statement. And it's a famous one. You maybe remember from school. Order is heaven's first law. In other words, God is a God of order, not some legalistic uh, stifling order. But the Bible says, let all things be done decently and in order. God's not the author of confusion. Now, he'll reveal confusion, but he's a God of order. And when we follow his ways, we can experience what we saw, peace and joy. In fact, you know, I've seen over the years, people say, oh, I get so frustrated about this. I can't find my car keys and all that. I said, well, do you put them in the same place? Well, no, I, I don't know. I go, it's in the purse, and then it's in here, and it's in the car. I, I, well, establish some order in your home, and you'll find peace. They, they are related. So Cicero said, order is heaven's first law. Now, this is all around us, what we're dealing with here. And Ray, I know you read the Tennessean. Uh, for those listening to video, that's our state newspaper. But I read, just like when I lived in D.C., I was right there in the midst of the political realm, 24 years. And I, I read the Washington Post, WOPO, because I would say, I want to know what the enemy's saying. Well, today it's even more. But there's a lady, and, you know, my, our neighbors who are from India, uh, I was hoping, because I know they, they'd be here, they had to change the last minute. But there's a lady that writes in there, and her name is Saritha Prab Prabho. And she, I've written, you've read her over the years. I mean, she's brilliant, but she's also uber-liberal, ultra-liberal, and she says, I'm a dyed-in-the-wool Democrat, and I'm a liberal. And when I'd read stuff by her, I'd, many times I'd say, well, whoo, wait, where'd that come from? But recently, I'm looking, and she, she writes this article on immigration. She says, the GOP is the grown-up party. Now, folks... Again, I'm not here, to, this is Republican Party, pro-Trump rally, this is not drain the swamp. I'm not, we're not talking parties and politicians. But I'm saying, here's a diet in the wool, and this lady says this, what has gone on, she's saying with the Democratic Party, she said, uncontrolled illegal immigration is no problem. Border protection is racist and offensive. Arresting and deporting criminal aliens, even those that are violent, is immoral. Enforcing our immigration laws is racist. She says, now we have leaders that are openly talking about abolishing the Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE. And this, she says at the end, she says, simply put, today's Democratic Party, this is a dyed the wool Democrat, and its media supporters has gone stark raving mad on immigration and have to be brought to heel through electoral losses. I mean, hey, God bless you. Saritha, well, I love you, baby. I'll take up an offering and give it to you. I was so blessed by that. 
in USA Today, <laughs> these are common. This is all around us here. Come to here. Forget the wall already. It's time for the U.S. to have open borders. Now, folks, uh, here, Trump, however, has it exactly backwards. The solution to America's immigration problems is open borders, under which the United States imposes no immigration restrictions at all. If the U.S. adopts this policy, the benefits will far outweigh the costs. And you got people cheering up a storm and people, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and folks, our president is, is trying to do something. And this is just one reason why he, and you know this was central issue in the campaign. It's going to be central issue. It remains that. It remains that. But our president said, quote, one of the reasons we need great border security, how practical is this? is that Mexico's murder rate is two, in 2017 increased 27% to 31,174 people killed. A record. The Democrats want open borders. I want maximum border security and respect for ICE and our great law enforcement professionals. Now, folks, it doesn't matter, party. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you. And let's get personal on this tonight. And again, you may say, Larry, I don't pay any attention to this. And I, I you know, I, I talk to people who say that. I talked to a leader while I was laid up. And honestly, I love him dearly. But he said, Larry, I said, hey, do you read the commentaries I do? He said, yeah. And then I wasn't fishing for anything. He said, but I got to tell you, Larry, we'd never have you in our church. We'd never have you speak. And I said, oh. And it wasn't like I want. I, and I said, why? He said, you're too political. You're too political. And I said, well, and I didn't want to engage on it, but I thought, much of this, this is moral. When people say, we don't deal with same-sex marriage, that's politics. I don't get into the LGBT stuff, that's, that's, that's politics. I don't get into abortion, we can't, I mean, that's politics. Folks, these are issues of morality. What are we talking about? And that's why I commend our pastor all these weeks laying out brilliantly this worldview. I'm, like I say, running in from the bullpen, but folks, we have to address these issues. This is reality. Let's get real. A couple of weeks ago, there's a ICE, uh, again, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Their, their office is there. And these people, anarchists, they're Antifa. I mean, they're there. And they're, they're bombarding it. It was scary. A mob. They're threatening the people's lives that are working there to defend and help and protect in Portland. It was, and the Wall Street Journal put the headline on, Anarchy in Portland. Now, I've been to Portland, and when I was there 20 years ago, they said, well, that was very liberal. But folks, and then they go to the, the, the official and the main leader in the city, he says, well, something like, you know, we got to be safe. You know, we got to have safe zones. In other words, do away with ICE. 20,000 people nationwide that are enforcing what we've established, and now that's one of the pushes. Get rid of ICE. And... My daughter, Melanie, was in 39 cities. She came back. And you know, when they went to one city in California, they were supposed to set up the tent. This was an evangelistic meeting in a, in a, a, a warp tour, rock, punk rock festival. But when they got there, you know, the leader said, you know what, you're going to have to, you know, help the homeless and all these people that are just settled there. They, they got to move. They can't be there. That's where you have. And as my daughters, they are trying to get things in order. And it's understandable. But a lot of the young people right there were saying, Hey, we can't do that, man. These are homeless. I mean, would Jesus do that? You can't do that. And the, see, people have misguided mercy. They do. They say you can't say no to people. You, you can't refuse. You can't. And then in the middle of that, especially with young people, there's a generation up for grabs. And, and as a young person here, I didn't watch it. I saw maybe four minutes of it. But the MTV, Music Video Awards. Now, folks, it's not just the tens of thousands or whatever, how many are there watching it? But it's millions, primarily of young people nationwide. And where does the whole show culminate? And I saw the clip. Is this rapper putting out a song? I forget, is it called One Day or something like that? And all these young people are running out there. And the main singer says, F the wall. Yeah, F the wall, man. And everybody's cheering as these young people are coming and they're representing young people that are separated from parents. And it's what this administration's done. Folks, the Obama administration held up and honored all of these laws regarding 
of, of individuals, families. There was separation to deal with documentation, all that. But as soon as President Trump heard that, within a day, it was done with. But no, if you saw this show, you'd think it's still in effect. And these people are with their T-shirts. We are human beings. And everybody's holding candles up. And the rapper's singing. And then all of a sudden in the back, we are humans. The wall comes down. And now we're in together. And we're going to see this thing to victory. It's propaganda to the nation. Yeah. yeah, Trump's a racist. He hates people. He's a bigot. And do you identify with him? Are you one of these crazy people? It's evil, folks. It's evil. USA Today, I just picked it up the other day. Uh, uh, folks, this is real. This is, that's why I say it's the real world. This is the front page. And you know, here's this beautiful 20-year-old girl in Iowa. How many times do you see it on a regular basis? An illegal immigrant. I, I won't even say what he did to her. She, I mean, she's dead. He should have been deported. Had no business being here. So here, and so what does front page say? No, immigrants don't commit more crimes than U.S.-born people. No. See, there's a culture in the media and the cable, and they've got to uphold that. And you say, well, I'd like to work for the New York Times and, you know, CNBC. If I get in there, I'd change things around. Oh, you wouldn't even be hired. That's right. They wouldn't hire you. Do you hate Trump? Do you hate what's going on? Do you hate this administration? But you know what? If you, don't, if you read this, you got to read the, oh, wait a little further. They got the senior researcher uh, of American Immigration Council, and he says he acknowledges that assessing the criminality of immigrants has always been difficult because statistics are they're really hard to come by. Local police do not list the immigration status of those arrested, meaning it's impossible to determine exactly how many crimes are committed by legal immigrants, undocumented immigrants. It's impossible. Wait, they're telling us on the front page. See, and there's other cases. I put this fellow in Philadelphia, and I see this, and I see people raped, murdered, and that does not mean every immigrant, please. That does not mean that. But I put here lawlessness. There's a breakdown of authority. There's cultural collapse. And the crisis is only going to be recognized with a biblical worldview. Now, I put here, there's two choices. We've got God, God's way or man's way. And I'm going to read this to you because I, I thought I got to write this down because I don't want to risk anybody saying, there, you misrepresented, you misled. But there's a narrative, if you're not careful, that circulates on a regular basis concerning immigration. And oftentimes, I'll say, look, the Statue of Liberty. And true. Give us your tired, your poor, teeming masses, yearning to be free. Isn't that, folks, that is America. That is exactly who we are, and we live it. But see, when you have, like, the minority leader of the Senate saying, tears are running down the cheeks of the Statue of Liberty. We've turned our backs on these immigrants. We've closed our borders. We've separated the families. We've hardened our hearts. We're not a compassionate nation. This is xenophobic and racist, and we got to change it. Folks, and people are cheering. But folks, the reality is the United States has the most generous immigration policies in the world. As a percentage of our population, the United States has more immigrants than any time since 1890. 50 million Americans are foreign-born. 50 million. Over 1 million are given permanent residence every year. A million. A million every single year. Plus, with something you're familiar with, maybe chain migration where people bring in, you know, relative, family, whatever, and it's an average of 3.4 on average to each. You add another 3.5 million. You got asylum seekers and refugees, 100,000. You've got millions that are here illegally, and the word is out. Free health care, food stamps, housing vouchers, education. But then you've got individuals that say, look, we don't want any restrictions. We don't want a wall. We don't want ICE. We don't want sanctions on sanctuary cities where people are openly defying and saying, we will not honor what our government policies are. Sorry. So I say it, it, it's not hateful to have a biblical position, but you better be very alert because there's such deception. Now, I want you to watch this little video. Some of you may have seen this, but can we show this? This is a video, and then I'm going to give you three objections, and we'll be finished. Watch this, okay? Is that ready? Okay, thank you.
Let's look at three steps to solve immigration the Jesus way. You know, my father was an immigrant. He came here from Poland as a child. We lived in really poverty with no car, no vacations. My dad worked as a janitor. My disabled mother scrubbed floors on her knees three days a week. I start here because I have real compassion for immigrants and I support immigration, legal immigration. Many well-intentioned, but I believe misdirected individuals, and I respectfully include here presidents and presidential candidates, influential politicians, and even news commentators. They seem to believe the compassionate solution to the escalating border crisis is just extend our arms and declare, y'all come in. Guilt is projected on any of us who sincerely disagree and dare to say, you're missing it. You're not handling this the way Jesus would. So who's right? Well, let's take a look at this. Over four decades ago, I worked at the AFL-CIO headquarters, right across the street from the White House in D.C. My job was in the Community Relations Department, helping union members and families with humanitarian needs outside of the contract of a union. Early on, I discovered there are requirements and limitations to assistance that's being offered. You know, in Matthew 22, Jesus told a parable of a man desiring entrance to an event, but he was refused entrance because he didn't honor the requirements. In Matthew 25, Jesus told of 10 young maidens desiring to gain entrance to a special occasion, and yet five were turned away, called fools. Why? Because they didn't fulfill the requirements. Let me give you three steps to solve the crisis. Number one, we need to extend genuine love to all immigrants. You look in the Old Testament, immigrants were to be granted acceptance. You'll see in the chapter, the verses here, they were given opportunities to collect food, and they were to be treated justly. This wasn't just some blanket entitlement because God required the immigrants to keep the laws of the land just like the native people. Number two, respect realistic limitations. If a lifeboat has a sign that says limit of 12, it can appear compassionate and say, well, let's, let's put 25 in, but the result will be the drowning of everyone. Today, America faces 19 trillion in debt. Cities are going bankrupt or on the precipice of insolvency. The welfare system is exploding. We're stretched to the max in our emergency rooms, schools, healthcare, and social service agencies. We need limits. Number three, obey the government and its laws. It's unmistakable that the divine directive is for citizens obey governing authorities. You'll see the verses. The one exception is if government forces us to violate a law of God. Now be honest, what is your reaction when you've stood in line for 20, 30 minutes for a ticket, maybe a restaurant seat and someone just barges in and says, you know, give me it. You'd say, hey, hey, wait, excuse me, you need to wait in line like the rest of us. We must, I say it again, build up and extend the long overdue border fences. Yes, walls and fences do work. Why else do we have them around the White House? How about Israel, China? They've relied on them for decades, centuries. The wall of China is 13,000 miles long, was built centuries before Jesus. It works for them. When elitists who live in their gated communities tell us fences don't work, I ask them, well then, why do you have them? Let me say this, when the bathtub's overflowing, the first thing you do is turn off the water. You don't debate whether to use a rag or a mop. The number one priority is shut off the water. This is a pivotal time, and it's a defining moment in our history. We need a unified response here in America. That's it. All right, now, <laughs> there are, you know, there are objections that people will raise. Now, you got to be ready so you can, in a winsome way, respond. Number one, people will say, these are the ones I always hear. Hey, as God's people, we love not judge or turn people away. Oh, we love and we don't judge or we don't turn people away if you're a Christian. Well, now wait. Now listen, and I can't go through all these, but here. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. Who said that? Jesus. Jesus. Luke 5. You go, and, and again, we're going to, when we have the video, then you'll see it. How about, you never turn people away. Larry, you can't call yourself a Christian and do that. Well, wait, Jesus said, it said, so much more the report went abroad, Luke 5, Concerning him, Jesus, great multitudes gathered to hear and to be healed of their infirmities, but he withdrew to the wilderness and he prayed. Bye. What did he do? He was led in the proper way. It wasn't need always constitutes ministry, whatever we... Matthew 22. Oh man, there is so many of these. Matthew 22. Jesus said, 
Now, when the king, the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there was a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, this is Jesus speaking, bind him hand and foot, cast him into the outer darkness. There men will weep and gnash their teeth. In other words, why do you weep, gnash your teeth? You regret. But this is Jesus. In the parable of the 10 maidens in Matthew 25, five were turned away. They were called fools for not fulfilling requirements. You know, I went across the street at the mall and I went in the fitness room. And it's funny, we can't have this kind of restrictions on people. Well, I walked in the door, I saw fitness room rules. Notify the manager, no food, no smoking. How come that's okay? How come I've traveled to over 31 nations and when I come back at the airport, whether it was Dulles or Atlanta, Hartsville, whatever it is, I get in line, I've got documentation, I got my papers, I got my passport, there's cubicles. You can't have mass chaos, moms walking in with six children screaming and who cares, just let them. It's an orderly, one by one, walls are there, documentation, and we go through. Folks, so much of this is common sense, but there are individuals in this nation, and I would say it's political people, they want to create a permanent underclass of individuals that get all the benefits, all the entitlements. Come on. But you know what? Make sure, vote for us. They don't have to say it. Just make sure you get on our side. Now, I, I spent a half hour with him. With, they're, they're beautiful next door. They would have been here tonight. But you know what? You check other nations. I mean, is it on the screen? Yeah. The Indians, these are wonderful. And here's, I just check it. You do your homework. Here's Indians. How do you become an Indian? Naturalization. On the, uh, under number four, you have to be in the country for 12 years. You may not have been living in India illegally. You, uh, folks, there are requirements to enter India. You say, well, that's, that's probably unique. They, they, I don't think they have a lot of people living there. Oh, you're going to be the most populous nation on earth. How about this one? I just checked this one out for the fun of it. I thought, how about Canada? I was in Canada about six months ago. It says to qualify for Canadian immigration, a person has to meet a minimum of 67 points with the maximum for each area as follows. 25 point, points for their educational background, 24 points from proficiency in the English and French languages, 21 points for previous work experiences, 10 points for being in the prime age of employment, and up to 10 if one has an offer of employment. Financial background is also taken into consideration. Education, language skills, ability to support yourself, no criminal record, clean bill of health. I've been to Mexico, El Paso, Juarez. Mexico has some border crossing areas, but they don't have any border patrols. Enter Mexico illegally, get ready, you're thrown right in jail. Oh, we shouldn't do that. Well, but they're letting them come over here. Well, they're bringing the brightest and the best, said a former president. And our president said, well, wait, not just, we have rapists and sex traffickers and that, and then bigot, he calls everybody a racist. Folks, you gotta be discerning, just like with that silly fungi thing. You gotta be, yeah, Trump, a Charlotte, Virginia, that racist, the Antifa rally they had. You remember what he said last year? There's good people on both sides, folks. Our president never said that about supremacists and those Antifa people. You know what he said? People that sincerely have conviction about Confederate statues. He said, there's good people on both sides. There are sincere people. But oh, the media pulls that out. And now that just thing circulates on a daily basis. Oh, God. All right. How about this objection? Walls are unbiblical. They're impractical. And social justice demands that we reject them. On the contrary, folks, walls are biblical. They provide peace, security, and clearly defined borders. It's got, folks, Psalm 1, now I'm just, now we'll put these up when we get the video all together, but Psalm 122, now I, I'm not going to go through all these, but walls, oh, you can't, you can't do this kind of stuff. Psalm 122, verse 6, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace within your peace be within your walls and security within your towers. Psalm 147. 
<laughs> Let me just go through a few of these. Psalm 147. There's so much on this, okay? Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion, for he strengthens the bars of your gates. He blesses your sons within you, and he makes peace in your borders. In your borders. Folks, there are people, they're called globalists. They don't want borders. One global world, one currency. Sounds a little bit too about some of the prophecies for the last days. Psalm 51, how about verse 18? Do good to Zion in thy good pleasure. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Do you know judgment was seen with Jerusalem and God's people when walls were come, came down? It was a sign of judgment. It wasn't, oh, good, the walls are coming down. Now it's going to be a mess and chaos. My favorite book in the Bible is, uh, is Nehemiah. I love my buddy, Nehemiah. I love this book. Oh, I love to preach from it. But you know what? You read Nehemiah, and they're asking, Nehemiah, what's going on back? He asked, what's going on back in the city? How, how is it after the captivity and all this? It says here in verse, uh, what is it, three? They said to me, well, you know, they said the survivors there in the province who escaped exile are in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is, it's broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. No walls, no borders. And then he said to those that were willing to get involved and rebuild those walls, he said, you see the trouble we're in? How Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned? Come, let's build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer disgrace. How about, I mean, you, you can look these up yourself. How about Proverbs 25? Maybe you taught your children that. Do you see a man without self-control? He's like a city without walls. And this idea, and folks, you might have gotten away with this maybe decades ago. And there have been restrictions in, in our history. There have been times where policies were set in and there were restrictions set. You can't do that. Well, it has been part of our history. Well, we need a new history. This country is no good. Make America great. America's never been great, said a so-called governor of a state recently. What kind of mindset is this? It's people that don't like this country, and they want a new one, a socialistic. Okay, you can look. Revelation 21 is a fun one. Look at John's vision of the city of God. Whoa, the walls, the beauty. Oh, the gates of the city. Okay, okay. Number three, lastly, Larry, and I'm not mocking. I'm just saying, Larry, godly people never reject those simply wanting a better life. How could you be so cruel? Well, now wait, I'm, I'm not rejecting people. I love people. But there are limits. There's order. There are laws. We just, our debt is $21 trillion now. You look at it, you know how much that means you owe? Andrew, you know how much you owe? This is every taxpayer. $161,000 you owe in that debt. That's your debt. Betty, you owe $161,000. That's now. People say, who cares? We got off the gold standard. We just keep printing money. Oh, a day of reckoning comes. 2008, people said it would never come, but irresponsible borrowing, irresponsible lending, bang, recession. I lost 50% of my 401. I don't never want to see that. Do you think we can violate God's laws and just keep going like this? We better be careful. Better be careful. Now, these verses, I want you to look them up on your own there. Leviticus 19 and right there. God said, help the people that are traveling. That was the culture, trade routes, wayfarers, people coming through. You would be kind. But in Exodus 12 and 23, he says, if you're getting that help, you obey the laws. It's none of this stuff about, well, we hide, it doesn't matter. Romans 13, 1 to 7, obey the governing authorities and the laws. I don't care. We don't obey. Well, I put this in ending here. Godly people never reject those simply wanting a better life. Open borders leaves immigrants living in constant fear of discovery. It diminishes their respect for our laws. It destabilizes our nation. Drug runners, sex traffickers, Sex traffickers. I'm glad there's not little ones to hear this tonight. You do a little study on that industry and what coyotes do and how people let their children just go. And then, and then we say, well, well, it really doesn't matter. Oh, it does. These are lives. Drug runners, sex traffickers, gang members, 
and even terrorists slip through without secure borders. So I end, and I say this, and I say this from experience. You can name your own. I've been to El Paso, how many times? 25, planted a church there. El Paso and San Diego, they had problems, but they have effective walls and fences that transformed high crime areas into peaceful, safe cities. People say, well, I want to go to San Diego. Well, they, 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 they saw a problem, they addressed it. Passport control, I mentioned this, customs in airports demonstrate walls work. They work. Really, I mean, some of this, again, like I said, common sense. Do we really want to say, it doesn't matter, amnesty for all, open borders, but what about ISIS? Oh, that's all nonsense. I don't believe that. That was just 9-11. What about people that have sexually transmitted diseases, people that use needles, and what about they bring certain sick... We don't have to worry about it. We got a good healthcare system. We, we cover that kind of stuff. And you hear this kind of stuff, and it's all like... And a lot of it is the multimillionaire celebrities that are telling us, open the doors, but go look where they live. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And I'd say this, uh, this is my proposal, and this is not brilliant, but I'd say this, for using, why not use local post offices and have sponsorship to bring people into our current, current eight-step process for citizenship and have a 30-day compliance period? What would happen if in unity, our government together said, there will be a 30 to 60-day notice and all illegal aliens, foreigners that have come here, we love you, we want to help you, but there is a new restriction, 30 to 60 days, you must go to the local post office, you must register, you must fill out your papers, and if you don't, there'll be a $1,000 fine each week, and then we offer people that are so passionate, and I, I understand that, to help the alien and the illegals that are here. Will you be a sponsor like we had a Peace Corps? Maybe we could use some of the billions that are being wasted to help compensate college students, others, to help people that are illiterate and do want to find their way and be naturalized as a citizen. This is not off the charts. It just takes some, I'd say, seeing it from God's standpoint. If you're willing, God said, and obedient, and I end. Oh, he says this, if you're willing and obedient, you'll eat the good in the land. There's a lot of good in this land that's being eaten in a way by people that are here and they've broken the world. And we need to help them and steer them. But this idea that the answer is just open borders, amnesty, who cares, eliminate ICE. In this pivotal time and defining moment in America's history, we need a unified response to turn this debacle around before it's too late.